Contested Bones. Part one. We're going to be discussing a book by uh, Chris Roop and John Sanford that just came out this last year, uh, Contested Bones. It's published by Feed My Sheep Publications. I was not able to find a city, but if you are interested, there is a website that contains uh, the, uh, you, can, you can get the, get it from that. You can also get it from the Institute for Creation Research, I think. I've ordered it. It's supposed to be on its way. We'll see how fast it gets there. Um, this is, uh, this copy is courtesy of, um, a Bernard Brandstater. Uh, give it back to him when I get my own. Um, it is not available, at least at present, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, electronic form. Hopefully they will change that. Um, and that's the cover. And uh, there is John Sanford and Christopher Roop. And for those of you who are not familiar, as a Cornell University professor, John Sanford has been conducting genetic research for over 30 years. This research has resulted in more than 100 scientific publications and several dozen patents. John is presently a courtesy associate professor at Cornell, president of Logos Research Associates, and president of Feed My Sheep Foundation. And that's what FMS Publications is from. Um, John's most significant contributions to science have been the biolistic process, that's also known as the gene gun, he invented that. Um, the book Genetic Entropy, development of Mendel's Accountant, which is a comprehensive and biologically realistic numerical simulation of the mutation selection process. You can put in how many mutations you want per generations, how much selection you're going to have, and uh, you know, uh, adjust it to various parameters. Uh, and four, the lead organizer and editor of the Cornell Symposium, uh, which used that, uh, many of which uh, the participants used the Mendel's accountant. Uh, the Cornell Symposium and subsequently published proceedings entitled Biological Information, New Perspective. Uh, both of those books we've uh, reviewed. I'm going to skip over the last paragraph because I'm not going to read everything that uh, you could possibly read, but... Is that uh, Cornell University was the first secular university yes. to develop in the United States. All the other universities and, were religious. And, and I think that uh, Andrew Dixon White or John Draper, I'm not sure which one, was uh, president of that university at one time. Right, right. Um, and so the warfare between science and religion, or the warfare between Christianity and religion, is is a uh, uh, an integral part of Cornell. So yeah, definitely, we're, we're going to read more about uh, John Sanford in a little bit. Uh, Chris Roop is a biologist and graduated <coughs> from State University of New York in Geneseo, I believe that's how you pronounce it, in two thousand nine. Since uh, 2011, Chris has been a research associate at FMS Foundation. So he's kind of, John Sanford's kind of taking him under his wing. Chris has uh, researched a broad range of biological topics, ranging from the origin of life to bacterial evolution to whale evolution to the famous riddle of Haldane's dilemma. Chris has published numerous articles on these topics. For the past last five years, Chris has been researching human evolution and the hominin fossil record, and the result is the book that we're going to be reviewing. Uh, personal Prologue by John Sanford. Why did Chris and I write this book? As a Cornell University research scientist and geneticist, I was a committed evolutionist for most of my adult life. For most of that time, I was fully persuaded that ape-to-man evolution was a simple and obvious fact of science. 
but I did not hold that view based upon careful examination of the evidence. Since I had only had a superficial understanding of the topic, where did my certainty come from? Like any other scientist who is outside their field of expertise, I was primarily persuaded by the pervasive groupthink, which is especially strong within the academic community. He knows he was there. A key component of the academic groupthink is that evolution explains everything. For scientists like myself, this overarching groupthink about evolution was powerfully reinforced by lay-level science articles and powerful visuals promoted through the mass media. Now, how many times have you heard, there's overwhelming evidence for evolution? Well, name some. Oh, it's just overwhelming. Such reinforcement was inherently superficial, but made me feel I was scientifically well-informed, and so I had good reason to feel very certain. But I never took time to actually study the relevant scientific literature. I was already certain. I am sure that many other academics have had the same basic experience. This would explain why so many academics are extremely certain of human evolution, yet have never actually studied it and have almost no grasp of the subject. More specifically, my certainty in human evolution was derived from my faith in the experts in the field. I assumed that there was no ideological agenda. I assumed the researchers were in agreement regarding the evidence, and I assumed that the experts must actually have ways to know for certain what happened in the very distant past. I was about 50 years old before I first began, began to seriously question human evolution. So he's most of his academic life. My initial skepticism was not based upon the fossil record, but upon my own genetic research. I was learning that there are clear limits to what can realistically be accomplished by the Darwinian process. That is, random genetic mutations filtered by natural selection. Ever since that time, 16 years ago, I have been doing original scientific research addressing this fundamental question. Can mutation selection transform an ape into a human being? And that's where Mendel's accountant comes from, by the way. There is now strong genetic evidence against ape to man evolution. However, people argue that the genetic evidence must be wrong because the fossil record clearly proves ape-to-man evolution. It is for this reason that Chris Roop and I began to carefully examine the fossil evidence that is said to prove ape-to-man evolution. For the last four years, we've been critically examining the evidence reported in several hundred technical papers, which describe the bones of tentative transitional forms between ape and man. Chris, a biologist, has done the lion's share of researching the relevant literature. I assume that's why his name is first. Um, together, we have connected the dots and co-labored in writing this book. That literature research is a pain in the neck, as I think Warren can tell you. We have been surprised by our findings. They didn't set out to find this. They were just looking at stuff and trying to make sense of it. The raw data, the bones themselves, do not show what is widely claimed. I can tell you that that's true for uh, the origin of life. I can also tell you it's true for radiometric dating. So it's not that surprising to me that they found this. Furthermore, it is clear that most of the re workers in the field sharply disagree about the key discoveries. Nearly all of the important bones are contested, hence our title. We will be extensively quoting the experts in the field, usually quoting directly from their technical papers, to show that the bones really are contested. Neither Chris nor I have a paleo PhD in paleoanthropology, so why should you bother reading this book? Perhaps it is because of the simple fact. Fresh scientific perspectives, paradigm shifts, almost never arise from established members of a given field. Outsiders are very often needed to help break free from the shackles of the groupthink. Perhaps Chris and I are playing the role of those little children who are not afraid to ask the question, where are the emperor's clothes? Where you see green ellipses, those are mine. We're obviously not going to read the entire first chapter straight through. The serious problems associated with the Darwinian mutation process combined with the serious problems associated with the fossil record, the discussion of which make up the bulk of this book, 
are sufficient for any reasonable person to question the ape man theory. The story. Given the problems, it seems only reasonable to consider alternative explanations for the origin of man. What reasonable uh, explanations are possible which might explain the origin of man? And they will have a chapter kind of positing their own theory at the end. It's not the only theory, and uh, it's not even the only creationist theory, but um, they make a good case for it, I think. Chapter one, the power of the paradigm. How many of you have seen this? Maybe I should ask how many of you have not seen this? It's ubiquitous. Um, the, in, on top of that, he has a quote and it's by David Pilbeam, professor at Harvard University, curator, a noted creationist institution, um, <clears throat> curator of paleoanthropology at Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology and National Academy of Science member. So part of the establishment. My reservations concern not so much this book, that is uh, Richard Leakey's Origins, but the whole subject and methodology of paleoanthropology. These are their ellipses, by the way, they're black. Um, perhaps generations of students of human evolution, including myself, have been flailing about in the dark. That our database is too, smart, too sparse, too slippery, for it to be able to mold to our theories. Rather, the theories are more statements about us and ideology than about the past. Paleoanthropology reveals more about how humans view themselves than it does about how humans came about. But that is heresy. And of course, that's a quote and you can, uh, uh, the uh, footnote gives a reference. The iconic ape parade. In 1965, natural history painter Ru Rudolf Zollinger created the most famous icon of evolution. Uh, the March of Progress. The illustration was a fold-out in, in the Time Life Nature Library book, Early Man. It portrays a series of alleged ape-like ancestors that become progressively more human as they march across the page. Interestingly, the figure's caption cautioned readers that the artistic representations were based upon, quote, fragmentary fossil evidence. The book freely confesses, although proto-apes and apes were quadru uh, quadrupedal, all are shown here standing for the purpose of comparison. All that time, there was no compelling fossil evidence to suggest that so-called proto-apes evolved into man. The transitional forms existed primarily in the artist's mind. Unfortunately, most people ignored the fine print because it was overshadowed by the persuasive image. A lifelong researcher of human evolution, uh, uh, the person who wrote Bones of Contention, uh, Marvin, uh, what? No, no, not, Lu uh, the, it's the other Bones of Contention, oh, it, no. the creationist one. Oh yeah, creation. Um, Lubinoff. Lubinoff, yes. Uh, a lifelong researcher of human evolution describes how the ape parade in icon impacted Western culture. This parade has been one of the most successful ever used to promote human evolution. It is constituted as a powerful visual proof for human evolution that even a small child could grasp. There were few social studies classrooms and, scho and school library bulletin boards where this parade was not prominently displayed. Because of its graphic power, it is still indelible, indelibly etched into the minds of billions. Uh, that, by the way, is a mutation. I don't know whether it was in Lubinov to begin with or whether it was in the book here. So I left it in. Uh, billions of people worldwide. That uh, visually powerful parade was so successful in advancing human evolution because it received a far greater distribution and viewing did, did the early man book. By the way, is, uh, would you say that's a uh, 
a beneficial or deleterious mutation. <laughs> worldwide mailings continuing Lubinov. Worldwide mailings for advertising purposes were made of the particular pages featuring the parade. The postings of these pages in classrooms and libraries meant that far more people saw the parade than possessed the book. Perhaps less than 5% of those who had the book actually read it, but they would have seen the parade. Thus, the visual image of the parade sold the concept of human ev evolution even though the book revealed that the parade was fictitious, or at least highly imaginative. There is no doubt that this mental image has been used to powerfully influence public thought and is now d very deeply embedded in the modern mind. To this day, different versions of the iconic ape parade can be found in textbooks and classrooms across the globe and throughout the internet. Since 1965, most people have been convinced primarily by the graphic itself. The power of the graphic has been strongly reinforced by sporadic headlines proclaiming important new fossil evidence which appear to always validate ape-to-man evolution. Most people have been persuaded from childhood that the fossil evidence is so overwhelming that human evolution is virtually undeniable. Very few people are aware that virtually every reputed ape-man bone has been contested by experts in the field. We have written this book to simply make more people aware that the actual fossil evidence is fragmentary and it is typically self-contradicting. Contrary to what is widely believed, the fossil evidence is weak and does not provide compelling evidence for human evolution. Well, I don't know that they, it's self-contradicting, but it certainly contradicts the standard theories. We ask you, the reader, to open your mind just a little and give us a fair hearing as we critically examine the scientific evidence that seriously challenges the popular point of view. We ask you to begin to discern between the hype on this subject and the actual science. We do not ask you to believe us based on, uh, upon our limited authority. We ask you to believe the actual data and writings in blue font from experts in the field. And I will leave that, their quotations of other people in blue. We trust that when you are done reading this book, you will at least acknowledge that the bones in question really are contested. Human evolution. The basics. Before we examine the problems associated with the current paradigm, we need to begin by outlining the popular science view of human evolution and by introducing some basic te terminology. Magazines like National Geographic and Popular Science simplify scientific topics for the sake of their bro very broad audiences. The same is true of museums and textbooks, and they go on to um, expound on that. The popularized story regarding human origins can be outlined as follows. Over three billion years ago, the first, and uh, that is a mutation that happened between their PDF and my, <laughs> um, again, you can ask whether it's uh, deleterious or, or beneficial. Um, uh, the, uh, what it is is FI in their PDF has been joined into one letter and it doesn't read straight across in, uh, a, at least in Mac uh, Keynote. So uh, uh, I tried to put all of them back and I put a lot of them back, but there's one I missed. I don't know why it doesn't underline that, but whatever. Bacteria, the first bacteria-like cell arose spontaneously from non-living matter. Then through the Darwinian mutation selection process, those bacteria gradually became fish, which later became apes, which later became man. An unknown, an unknown apish creature that lived roughly five to 10 million years ago was a common ancestor of both man and chimpanzee. The common ancestor split into two branches with the chimp lineage staying largely the same. However, during the same time, the human lineage was radically transformed into modern man. It is, thought, it is not thought that we evolved from chimpanzees, but rather humans and chimps diverged from an unknown African ape, which is now extinct, and which apparently left, left no bones. It's called vaporware in... in uh, <clears throat> this unknown creature is simply referred to as the last common ancestor of man and chimp. Interestingly enough, 
most people think that it looked more like a chimp than it did like a man, so that it is not really that terribly unreasonable to call us evolving from a chimp. Actually, a chimp gorilla. The evolutionary branch that would eventually lead to modern man is said to have evolved through a series of transitional forms whose bones have been recovered from various sites. The reputed ape human intermediates, sometimes informally referred to as ape men, are more correctly termed hominin. That is, all the intermediate types between the hypothetical least commonest ancestor and man. I want you to notice that hominin is different from hominid. The term hominin, uh, which is different from the broader term hominid, which refers to any human or any ape or any possible intermediate. But hominin is something directly in line. Uh, most of the hominin types that we will be examining in this book involve just two classifications or taxonomic genera. The two genera are named Australopithecus, Latin for southern ape. Australia is the southern continent. Uh, and Homo, Latin for man. Um, there are a few peripheral genera that have been named, which are quite clearly apes and have no clear place in the ape to man progression. And they give the example of Ardipithecus. Um, there's a bunch of texts behind that. The study of reputed hominin bones and their artifacts such as stone tools is called paleoanthropology. Paleoanthropology is a very cumbersome word and so we will use uh, most often simply refer to it as the field. And same way with paleontologists, our paleo experts, or paleo community sometimes. Various bones that are claimed as hominin transitional forms have been given long Latin names such as Australopithecus, Barel Ghazali, I think I got that. Um, <clears throat> scientists and science writers often shorten these names and we will do the same wherever possible. And for example, Australopithecines instead of Australopithecus and the, uh, the genus um, Australopith sometimes, Afarensis, Australopithecus Afarensis, R.D., uh, Hobbit for Homo oriensis, that's the Flores people, uh, Sediba, Habilis, Naledi, Erectus, Neanderthal, and Lucy, which is Australopithecus Afarensis. Um, that will set the stage when we're reading later um, in uh, some of the specifics. The story of human evolution has been under continuous revisions ever since the time of Darwin. And they make the point that Ernst Meyer had this straight line which gave rise to that uh, uh, icon of evolution, the, the drawing. Um, as we will see, this outdated and oversimplified picture has been eclipsed by a very different story. The new story says there is no clear fossil trail leading to man. Instead, there is only a tangled bush with no discernible ancestor descendant, descendant lineages. You have a branch here, a branch there, a branch there, a branch there, whatever. The once popular, and he's quoting, um, and I forgot to put in the guy's name, the once popular fresco showing a single file of marching hominids becomes ever, becoming ever more vertical, tall, and hairless now appears to be fiction. When you see that drawing, think it's wrong. And by the way, that's not a creationist speaking. Scientific, and there's another quote behind it that I omitted that says basically the same thing. Um, Scientific method, the basics. There are two types of scientific inquiry that are very different, operational science and historical science. Unfortunately, many people fail to grasp the difference. Operational science is a type of science that involves conducting repeatable experiments in the present. Operational science includes the physical science such as chemistry, physics, and life sciences such as cell biology. This type of science is extremely powerful, but still has limitations. Historical science is the type of science that deals with questions about the past. I think there's maybe a paragraph between these two. Um, 
if about the recent past it is often called forensic science. Historical science is a soft science because history cannot be repeated and is not generally accessible through experiments conducted in the present. Although it may suggest experiments and experiments may, may be relevant for it. Uh, historical data is usually very limited and fragmentary and is often modified or corrupted. Observation of such data is made in the present and then inferences or educated guesses are made about a hypothetical past event. Historical science is inherently uncertain, more uncertain than, than operational science. And inferences are strongly affected by presuppositions and personal prejudice. Historical science routinely goes beyond the defined limits of the scientific method. Ernst Meyer, a renowned evolutionary biologist from Harvard, explained this critical distinction between historical and operational science. Evolutionary biology, in contrast with physics and chemistry, is a historical science. The evolutionist attempts to explain events and processes that have already taken place. Laws and experiments are inappropriate techniques for the explication of such events and processes. Instead, one constructs a historical narrative consisting of a tentative reconstruction of the particular scenario that led to the events one is trying to explain. Um, you can sometimes get some experiments, um, and they may be relevant, but it's a lot harder to do historical science. The basic concept of the ape to man er uh, narrative was constructed during the time of Darwin 150 years ago. It was accepted as a fact long before any significant hominin fossils were found to validate the theory. Um, there's another mutation that should read this. This evolutionary narrative has consistently influenced how the bones have been interpreted. The bones have always been interpreted in light of the widely accepted ape to man story. This is very significant. It means that the science of paleoanthropology is not merely a matter of digging up fossils and describing what they look like. Taxonomic classification, there's another mutation. The basics, assigning bones to specific species, that is making taxonomic distinctions in our opinion should be based upon obvious similarities and should be consistent with common sense. However, taxonomists have a great deal of artistic license and taxonomic groupings are typically defined based on who has the most influence in a given biological er arena. Well, that sounds scientific. The cr criteria for distinguishing taxonomic groupings often involve minutia. Because taxonomic groupings are often very subjective, such groupings are largely based upon arbitrary distinctions. Taxonomists tend to fall, uh, that's especially true with species. Taxonomists tend to fall into two competing camps, the lumpers and the splitters. Splitters are naturally inclined to split hairs. They subdivide taxonomic groups based on, upon minute differences. If splitters did not know about dogs and they were to dig up a vast dog graveyard, they would be inclined to think that every breed was a different species. How do you mesh the Chihuahuas and the Great Danes? Uh, tip, similarly, splitters would say that there are many species of baboons. There are five different species of baboon, possibly seven, depending on who you ask. Each species has certain morphological distinctions, yet they are all also all very similar in their general anatomy and can probably interbreed. If the casual observer were to look at those dis different species, they would likely make no distinction and call them all baboons without hesitation. Other taxonomists, lumpers, would agree and would say that all baboon species should be lumped together as a single variable species. If scientists tend to arbitrarily split species that are alive today, where living specimens can be studied in detail, Imagine the potential for making this error based upon a handful of bone fragments. When a paleo expert finds a new bone, there is strong motivation to become a splitter, to have their discovery be a new and important species. You do not get famous by discovering already recognized species. Bernard Wood, uh, whom we'll, I think, see in the next chapter, says, 
Uh, critics of the bushy family tree have charged that paleoanthropologists have been overzealous in identifying a new species from their finds, presumably out of a desire for fame and further research funding. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Perhaps this explains why so many ancient bones are claimed to be in the human lineage, while only one bone has been attrib attributed to the chimp lineage. Interesting. As Donald Johansson, discoverer of Lucy, confesses, in everybody who is looking for hominids, there is a strong urge to learn more about where the human line started. He describes this motivation as very seductive, making it easy to find yourself straining your eyes to see the bones a certain way. We, along with many biologists, are lumpers. We do not trust the tendency of splitters to define every variant as a new species. We feel lumpers are more realistic. We understand that many populations constitute one large interfertile group, even when they display diverse morphologies and are separated geographically. While extreme splitters would subdivide the dog breeds into many species, lumpers would say that all canines, dogs, wolves, coyotes, dingoes, etc., are the same species. Biologically, this is very reasonable because all canines are interfertile and can produce viable hybrid progeny. Within the hypothetical family tree of modern man, there are really only two meaningful genera. The first genus is Australopithecus, Latin for southern ape. This genus is extinct, and while we find many variations within these bones, all of the Australopithecus bones seem to reveal an animal type that is very similar to living apes, such as chimpanzee. This is perfectly consistent with the name of the genus. The second genus is Homo, Latin for man or human. The Homo type is consistently seen to be distinctively human, regardless of whether we are talking about the living people or the bones of the people who lived long ago. Again, this is in perfect keeping with the genus name. This creates a serious evolutionary problem because there is no intermediate transitional genus. One genus is clearly ape-like, the other genus is clearly human-like. The large anatomical gap between the two kinds is very striking. For this reason, paleo experts wish to bridge the gap and are especially eager to find Australopithecus bones that seem more human-like or Homo bones that, are, that seem more ape-like. This tension will become apparent as we begin to examine the most recent fossils. And uh, so that is where they're going. Chapter two, theory in crisis, even with all the fossil evidence and analytical techniques from the past 50 years, a convincing hypothesis for the origin of Homo remains elusive. And that's paleoanthropologist Bernard Wood of George Washington University. That's what we'll be talking about next time, is the, the crisis in the theory. And they're gonna document it from evolutionists themselves. And my take, I like the book. It is thorough, heavily documented, and tries to be fair. We will not be able to thoroughly examine all the evidence given in the book. There are th those who are interested in digging deeper are strongly encouraged to buy the book. Right now, the book is only available in traditional form. There are no e-books. And for what it's worth, the last two times I checked, Amazon was out of it. And they didn't know when they were going to get more. I don't know whether that's because they don't want to buy more or whether that's because they sold out so quickly. But I guess you can get it, I think, from from uh, Creation Research Institute, and uh, you're supposed to be able to get it from the Feed My Sheep Foundation as well. The preface reminds us that John Sanford was not a religiously educated zealot. He came to his views in large part due to the scientific evidence. And I think that's an important point to make. This is a major catch for creationism. Uh, as far as I can tell, he had tenure because of a distinguished career before the change, and that's why he's still on the Cornell faculty, because they can't get rid of him. I like the way the book is written without the bombast one sometimes sees in creationist writing, although we haven't gotten too far yet. Um, 
I will tell you that having read the entire book, uh, my impression is that. Uh, both authors seem to, be allow, seem to be able to allow the evidence to persuade rather than trying to sell us on something, which I think is a welcome development. And, uh, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. I did not realize that even even evolutionists, you're saying, may do not see intermediaries. There's they, when they find a bone, they either it's either strictly human or strictly ape. I thought I guess I didn't think of. That. Uh, well, let's put it this way: some don't, some do, and. Uh, you're going to basically you're going to hear the case for don't uh, from people who probably didn't have to look at it that way and I think would have reported what they found um, uh, but uh, their claim and we'll see how good it is as we go through but I uh, having read the book I think it's a pretty decent claim <laughs> I will venture my opinion to start off. Um, some things immediately are red flags. <laughs> um, one thing that's a red flag is when they take the position that they are, I assume, they're lumpers. Yes. Because... Well, they what, say that. What? Yeah. And what they used was a little insinuation about splitters. They're good at splitting hairs, which every splitter would strongly uh, refute. They're not there to split hairs. It, it was a tongue-in-cheek thing. I don't think that's a, a good scientific approach. Uh, I, I'm looking at it now as more a scientist. In popular uh, writings, it's good. It catches people's attention. They know what splitting hairs is about. Um, the uh, other thing that um, I, I'm looking at is the uh, question of, of um, evidence. Evidence backing up what they say. Now, it's premature. This was introduction, so you don't, you don't have a lot of footnotes in introduction. But when they say that splitters would treat every type of dog as a separate species. I don't know of any splitter that would ever do that. That's, to me, that's a very extreme statement. Now, maybe they're going to be able to document that. So I don't have the book. Well, maybe they will show that there are people uh, dividing up the whole dog group into, I'm talking about domestic yeah. dogs, right? Uh, now you have wild dogs well, and you have other dogs. And I don't know of anyone, and you could correct me, it's, we have biologists here. Are, you know, are they trying to split up dogs mm -hmm. into species? They're varieties, that's mm -hmm. a different thing. Well, no, I, I think yeah. there is a point that, it, that should be made at the, uh, right now, and that is that Carolus Linnaeus, or Carl von Linne, or whoever you want to call him, um, actually was a splitter to begin with Most, and uh, then later in life a became a lumper. Mm -hmm. oh. Started asking questions as to whether horses and zebras belonged all in the same group. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, not only are, <laughs> does it exist, but we can we can see people switching from one to another, and uh, I, I mean this is probably the greatest taxonomist of all time. Yeah. Certainly the uh, one who had the biggest job. And uh, and when he starts saying, but they can cross, <laughs> well that must mean they're really the same species. Uh, As uh, you know, the problem with paleoanthropology or any field of paleontology is you cannot test them by interbreeding. Exactly. So it, it's, uh, 
It's a huge challenge, and that's why paleontologists often make wild guesses and uh, obvious mistakes. Well, <laughs> supposing that you dug up a boxer, a, you know, a, or, or, or bulldog, and you see this little short snout pushed in, and there's a skull in front of you, and I mean, it looks like a whole different facial features. But you didn't know that the boxer could breed with the German Shepherd down the road. You know, you would be tempted to call it a different <laughs> species. Well, but, I'd like to see documentation. Maybe it'll come. No, have you ever seen the face of a boxer? I'm talking about documentation, and <laughs> not yeah. guesswork. <laughs> Uh, I interpreted this in uh, the context of uh, just picking up a fossil and comparing the fossil types without being able to breed. Uh, I think the temptation would be great to uh, distinguish a Chihuahua from a Great Dane, uh, make two different species. You, you get to name more species. Uh, you can't test them uh, in terms of the breeding test. Uh, well, I, I, think I, 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 I think they'd be laughed at if they tried to, to say a Chihuahua and the Great Dane were the same species. There's the Kaibab squirrels, on the, one on the north side and one on the south side of the Grand Canyon. They're different species. And they're, they're the same species. And I don't know that anybody has ever even done a interbreeding test. They, they both have tufts on the end of their ears. They look very similar, but they're, you know, they're obviously been isolated from each other and they probably don't like each other very well. Well, uh, of course, the basic problem is we don't know what a species is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this complicates the picture, but uh, we try and work with what we have and uh, sometimes we're right, but not often, not very often. Uh, and then, of course, there's always a tendency to, uh, to name more species because uh, uh, it's part of the game. I mean, you're, Well, not, uh, not only do you get more funding, but you also get your they, name after you it. You get your name behind the species. You're the first one that named it. I mean, it's, you know, every time somebody is going to name the species and give the full name, that's your name behind it. It's impressive. Uh, yes, and then we'll There, there are, I think, species that have been named on the basis, later found to be just environmental factors that change the anatomy of the shell considerably. Uh, and uh, they weren't valid distinct species. It was the same species, but it looked very different. And at first it was uh, named as two separate species, but they had to combine them. Yes? It seemed to me like in your presentation that what they were doing was making an illustration of what a splitter would be like if they came across a cemetery of a bunch of dogs and they'd never seen a dog before and they found Great Danes and Chihuahuas and all kinds of stuff mixed up in this cemetery. Dachshunds. And so they, they would think, oh my goodness, we've found a whole bunch of species because they'd never seen a dog before. That seemed like the illustration to me. Yeah. Uh, and. I mean, while you can't actually prove that, I think that, the, that it does make the point they're trying to make, and then you can judge whether it's valid or not. Yeah, I didn't think they were making a scientific argument right there. I think they were just doing an illustration. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, and then uh, Jack. Uh, Dr. Game, I want to congratulate you on your presentation. I feel I know the main outlines of the argument of the book, without ever reading it, you've done such an excellent job of excerpting and then commenting on it. Of course, not the details. And uh, I want to say, having heard it, that I'm in complete agreement with the book uh, in that main argument that uh, mutation, genetic mutations filtered through natural selection cannot explain the transition 
from pre-hominid types to genuine hominids, and especially in Homo sapiens. Sandrin but, will be happy to hear and any, that. And, but, any, and I, but anything that I do say of a critical nature now is not disagreement with that main line of argument. Sure. But I think that as you presented the argument, Miss is the most powerful uh, set of evidence that supports this idea that genetic mutation filtered by natural selection cannot produce Homo sapiens sapiens as we are today, and that it requires some additional explanation mm -hmm. that is missing. Uh, and that's to be found not in paleontology, but in psychology. Uh, I think that the, the uh, discontinuity in the record, which the book is arguing for, although it obviously is there in the fossils, as, as you suggest, and as you say the book suggests, the greatest discontinuity occurs psychologically about 50,000 years ago in the transition from Cro-Magnon man who lived very nearly at an animal level in just 50,000 years to Homo sapiens sapiens as you find him in ancient Sumer and in the biblical account of Abraham and his journey and the founding of human civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, the gap there uh, Cro-Magnon man lived almost at an animal level, very rudimentary use of fire, uh, flaking of stone stools for crude instruments like hand axes and uh, awls and so on. 50,000 years later, a time so brief from an evolutionary point of view that hardly any species changes could be accomplished, you find humans in ancient Sumar but with grid pattern cities, understanding the astronomical relationships uh, of monumental architecture to the movements and alignments of the heavenly bodies, writing literature and creating sculpture and art and monumental architecture, some of which would be difficult to duplicate today with all our technology. Yeah. How did that transition in just 50,000 years occur. And it implies very strongly, as you summarized in your argument, that some additional explanation is needed here. Uh, we've just completed a book published on a Amazon in which we think we have a hypothesis about what that might be. I won't go into it here. But uh, we do believe that the explanation is to be found in the Bible. And if you examine the etymology, the hermeneutics, and the history of hermeneutics carefully, I think you'll find that there is evidence in the Bible that 50,000 years ago, something occurred to humans that cannot be accomplished by evolution. It requires a creational explanation. So uh, that's my take. Your summary of the book. Well, um, uh, they're actually going to go into uh, a little bit about what makes humans humans. I think we have to be a little bit careful about making civilization the. Uh, uh, I think when you get to civilization, you're definitely there, but it looks like even before civilization, for example, Bushmen in Africa who uh, didn't leave buildings of that kind. Uh, the best that they had would be like stone circles with, uh, with uh, stuff on them, uh, you know, I think are still human. And, uh, and in fact, Homo naledi, we're gonna talk about later on, who buried their uh, dead in a cave, which is completely inaccessible to most animals. I think they found a rat and an owl down there. 
Oh. And a baboon tooth, which may have been taken down, I don't know. Uh, but that's it. And it's a narrow crawl space. It is unbelievable how far from the rest of the world they buried that stuff. Well, I stress civilization in, uh, in my remarks yeah. because, in my opinion, civilization is the one differentiator that really genuinely separates Homo sapiens yeah. from the rest of the animal world. Yeah. Uh, evolutionists, let, let, me, yeah. let me make my point here. Yeah. Evolutionists, of course, try to show that minute mutations are, in the case of Stephen Jay Gould, mm -hmm. punctuated evolution, macro mutations right. of some sort, uh, can account for this 50,000 year translation a transition yeah. from living like other animals to being the only animal ever to create civilization. And other hypotheses like Steven Pinker, that evolution must have done the same thing yeah. that artificial intelligence people do in inventing speech recognition. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't wash. And uh, E.O. Wilson's argument that the conflict between survival of the individual and the survival of the species somehow pumped yeah. the brain up to its present level. But Neanderthal, who had brains as large or larger than ours, and lived with us to the point of interbreeding, as genetics now shows, had the same motivations, but they did not produce civilization as we yeah. manage today. Something intervened that gave us a unique differentium and that differentium is civilization yeah. it's not tool using it's not speech uh, it's civilization in my well it, one of the things that you'll find also if you look at it is that uh, American Indians or Amerindians or whatever they're now called um, lived in this country without leaving a lot of remains although we know that because uh, you know, Europeans who came over found them with um, uh, the ability to make bows and arrows and, you know, fairly complicated stuff, um, uh, were apparently able to do this. And then all of a sudden in the southwest United States, there grew up a culture that started building monster buildings for their time. I mean, m at one time, the largest apartment building in the world was in the southwest United States. And furthermore, it was built so that, because we still have the building there, at midsummer, when the sun rose, light would shine onto a specific spot, and they'd actually marked it. And, and so what that implies is that American, oh, uh, what that implies is that American Indians had the potential within them to do that. They just didn't get around to doing anything that left permanent enough uh -huh. uh, remains that we could tell. But in the meantime, they're building these giant yeah. mounds and burying their dead in them and stuff yeah. like that. So, um, uh, I think you have to be really careful about uh, uh, about saying that if you don't see that, I mean, if you see that, I think you see something important. Well, if you don't see that, it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. It just means that we haven't found it yet. Well, when I speak of the magnitude of the gap, psychologically dwarfing the paleontological gap, uh, Theodosius Dobshansky, the uh, Russian yeah. paleontologist, felt it was so great that he says it appears as though Homo sapiens appeared, then disappeared as Neanderthal rose to sapiens, and then reappeared again. And for him, the question was, what caused that reappearance? Yeah. And all of these explanations by E.O. Wilson and Pinker and yeah. the others. They don't wash. Sure, because civilizationally, the difference being, between being able to put a man on the moon and bring him back yeah. And being able to invent a bow and arrow or even uh, for 
several generations or yeah. thousands of humans to build a great pyramid yeah. is well, a magnificent the, difference. The, the fact is that we are sitting in chairs made by humans, in an amphitheater made by humans, in a building made by humans, air conditioned, lighted, everything, computer. There are no chimpanzee equivalents. There are no chimpanzee even close to equivalents. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. I believe the Bible suggests the second creative activity occurred about 50,000 years ago, specifically relating to humans and yeah. the difference. Yeah, well, we're going to have some fun with that uh, date as well. So, yes. Well, when you can bring the tools of modern laboratory science to this question, it doesn't make it easier. It makes it much more complex. Yes. Because yeah. there is clear evidence for the erection of reproductive boundaries. Yeah. That have been evaluated. Uh, in other words, speciation, as we think of it, can happen in uh, structurally identical organisms due to a change in. Uh, the ability to interreproduce, which can be for a number of reasons. Yeah. But yeah. when you have that complexity, when you can bring the best tools to evaluate it, it makes these questions simply, if, if put to the same test, they remain opinions. Yeah. Well, we're going to see the evidence, and then you guys can make up your mind as to what... Uh, what it actually means. And of course, they'll give you their take on the evidence, but uh, where I particularly li listen to them is where they have photos of hands. And I know enough about human hands and I know a, a little bit about chimpanzee hands and, and it's simply a matter of comparing and, and seeing what it looks like. And then uh, you can see whether their project is going to work or not. I think that they came at it with uh, certainly the possibility that it could work. Uh, they may have even come at it with the probability that it worked, but I think if they had found true halfway houses that we would hear about it. I think my point was that anatomical, anatomical similarity or dissimilarity is never a clear line of evidence to say there is no difference there uh, species wise or right. there is and if that's the best we've got then in other words the question kind of needs to remain open even in the best substantiated yeah. uh, studies let alone these kinds of things which are extremely important but nonetheless uh, yeah. the humility to recognize these that insecurities we, that we don't is know. what is really missing right well, it's, it's going to be an interesting journey. We'll look at various things. Uh, next week we'll be uh, looking at the general difficulties that are in the field, and the week after that, uh, something doesn't intervene, we'll be looking at Neanderthals again. <laughs>